This video, we want to look at um, Studio 5000, which is the development tool, the programming software for the logics controllers, being both the control logics and the compact logics. So again, we have control logics in our lab, and that's what we'll be working with, um, hopefully. So uh, we'll talk more about control logics, but again, the, the compact logics, control logics, uh, essentially they're the same in how they operate. They're just different hardware platforms. Um, so when we come to uh, first open up Studio 5000, and again, um, just want to say too that this is, uh, you know, you are used to TIA portal so far, working with TIA portal on the Siemens S7-1200 PLCs. So this is basically the Rockwell equivalent of the TIA portal. Um, so similar tool, uh, and it's going to have a pretty similar look and feel to some extent, uh, definitely some differences to it. Uh, so your options are straightforward. You can create a new project, you can import, you can um, open existing projects, you can even upload out of an existing controller. So if you had a program already in a controller, you can upload it out of the controller and, and use it. Um, down below are all my recent projects that I've uh, kind of used here in the past. So if I choose new project, we'll come up with this, um, this little menu will pop up. And we can see we got a few things we can choose from. We have a uh, architect factory talk view, which will be our panel view um, piece that we'll learn about in our, our next learning module on HMIs. Um, logics, of course, is the controller. And there's another one called view. So there's, there's a newer panel view, which actually could use the Studio 5000 software. Um, again, we'll explain that um, in the next module, a little too, too deep to get into here for this one. Um, so we're going to stick with logics, and you can see we have several choices. We have the uh, compact, uh, compact guard logics, compact logics, control logics, and then we also have the different uh, control logics options: the 5570, the 5580. So this refers back to our L7 and L8 controllers. So it's important to know when we build this what, what controller we're using. We can always change it later if we make the mistake or don't know and we just want to choose something, um, we can change it later. But um, uh, it's nice to know it up front. Now in the lab, at, you know, at, at the lab at um, um, Delgado, we have the L7s. So we're going to stay with the L7 family. And there's, you know, five versions of the CPU, L71, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, if you remember from that chart from a few pages ago, um, the, the only difference between each one of these is uh, the memory, the amount of memory in on board the controller. Other than that, it's the same chipset, same um, computing power, horsepower, whatever you want to say. Uh, it's just that the memory is different. So I'm going to choose an L73 just because, um, middle of the road. And we'll call this uh, ELET 287. A demo. I think I might already have one called that, but we'll go ahead and uh, press our luck. And um, the other option here is that, as uh, you know, when you get in the real world, there'll be many different versions out there. Um, 32 is the latest version, but you might have some older equipment out there that supports older versions of, of uh, Studio 5000. So you can have multiple versions installed on this on this computer, and you can choose what version you want to develop for. So on this, on my laptop, I've got versions 21, 30, 31, and 32 all installed. We'll go with 32 since it's the latest guy. Um, next option for you to choose is the, the, the chassis. How many slots are in a chassis? I'm gonna, we'll go with 10, that was the default. Um, and uh, the rest of this is, is good, but we'll go with no protection. You, you can enable some security features. Um, I would suggest we don't do that in the lab um, because you will lock it out and not be able to get into the controller. And uh, that is not a good thing. So let's just keep everything as no protection. Um, but as we get out in the real world, you, you might want to enact some security on your controllers to keep people from, um, you know, uh, getting in there and, and making unwanted changes or, or uh, uploading your code and stuff like that. And we'll hit finish. All right, so the, uh, the, after I hit uh, finish, it, it uh, took a minute or two and, and it, it went ahead and opened up and created the, um, the project. 
And uh, again, similar to the Siemens TIA portal software, we've got the uh, the control organization or organizer, and we get the, the kind of the the tree format of everything. So we have our um, our main controller up here. We've got controller tags. We've got our tasks, which will be our our main program where we put our where we actually put our ladder logic at. Um, and we have uh, you know our I/O configuration sitting down here. Uh, up top, you'll see we have um, you know, things like the run, the OK, um, IO light. So if we're connected to the controller, we would you know be given its uh, its status if it was running or if it was OK. And even if the IO is um, if it's connected or if it, if they lost an IO card, that would be flashing. Um, we can change our state from go online, upload, download right here. I'm not connected to a live controller, so I can't demonstrate that to you right now. Um, all the menu options up top. And uh, of course, some of the ladder elements are shown right here too. So if, if I went into the editor, I'd be able to, um, you know, drop normally open contact, normally close contact, coils and whatnot into the logic right here. Um, so let's, uh, so let me just start by showing you the controller tags, because right now there actually is nothing created. Okay. So, um, you know, back in the Siemens world, there was controller tags as well, or tags. Um, don't know the exact nomenclature, but you, very similar approach. These are the tags that, that are available in the controller. So nothing's here right now, uh, since we're a blank slate. So what we want to do is we want to add um, some IO cards to the configuration. And as we do that, these tags will start to show up. And this will be kind of the main difference between the Siemens world that you're used to so far, and then now the new Alan Borelli world. So let me just add um, a, a discrete input card. I'll add a discrete output card, and I'm gonna add an analog input card just to keep it um, kind of simple and straightforward. So down here uh, in the tree, we have the IO configuration. And right now we have a you know 1756 backplane and it's an A10, meaning it's a 10 slot chassis. And we have the L73, uh, CPU in slot zero. So this number in the in the brackets is the slot. So recall that we start with zero. So it's a 10 slot chassis, but the very first slot is actually slot zero. So I'm going to right click on backplanes and I'm going to choose new module. So as good, we went back into the selection guides. We, you know, had you look at the selection guides, and we talked about you know choosing different I/O cards. Um, here's where we're actually going to enter that that card, that catalog number uh, that we have chosen to put in here. Now, um, when I did the IAB uh, builder, I uh, I chose IB16. So we'll go ahead and go with that guy. So all, all I did was I started to type in a catalog number, I1756-IB16. And it kind of uh, searched and auto solved all the combinations down there. So here's IB16. I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to say create. Uh, now we get the properties for that. And all we got to really do at this point is we need to give it a name. Um, kind of an interesting concept, but we're going to give this card a name um, just to kind of help identify it from the other input cards that are there. Um, being that I'm only going to have one, I'm just going to go ahead and call it a uh, discrete input. Okay. And it's going to be in slot one. If I wanted to, I could say it's going to be in slots two, three, four, whatever other slot, but let's just say it's in the very next slot next to the CPU. I'll give it slot one. Uh, one other thing to note at this point is this electronic keying. So there's a concept in, um, with the, with the control logics that you can enable a uh, compatible module. And that, what that means is that I can only replace this card with a card that is, is compatible. So it's a way to kind of prevent um, an operator from yanking out a card and sticking in something that doesn't belong there. Um, it will basically shut, shut it down and say, no, that's not the card that belongs in this, in this rack or in this slot. Um, I can change that setting from exact match to compatible to completely disable the keying, okay? So when you get back in the lab, sometimes we will have to maybe turn off disable keying 
or turn on disable keying to uh, to kind of get through some some quirky issues. Um, but I'm going to leave it default right now. But I wanted to kind of show you that. The rest of these tabs are just some basic parameters and maybe set points that we can uh, or properties that we can come back and fix on this card if we need to. At this point in the time, um, we can leave it default. So we're going to say OK. Now, I can close this. And if you notice, I now have some tags that were created in our controller tags. So local colon one colon C and colon I. So local refers to the fact that it is local and in the CPU chassis or the, this, this chassis that we're working with. So it's a local card. One refers to the slot that it's in. So it's in slot one. The, the colon C and the colon I refers to the type of data. So C refers to configuration type data. All right, so whatever particular configuration data that I can actually read from the card, I could do it under these tags. The I would stand for the input. So whatever data, right? So here um, I can read the, uh, the data off the card. So this is how I'm going to actually reference the input points themselves. All right. Uh, so let's go back here. Let's create another new module. This time, let's do a 1756-OB. Uh, and we said 16E, I believe, when we did our IAB. So let's go ahead and uh, choose that guy. And I have to give it a name again. So discrete output. Um, you here you'll see you got similar things as well to some basic diagnostics or properties, I should say, for the um, for this card. And we're going to say OK. And as soon as I did that, I've got my now local two, C, I, and O. Now, this is interesting because this is an output card. So we got the configuration data. We got the O, which would be the output data. But we got the I, so we say this is input data. So a lot of times the I would be if there's particular fault codes or if it's a diagnostic card, they'll treat those as inputs. But be uh, always be aware that if this is an output card, we want to reference the output data points as what we're going to actually use to turn on an output. So we want to make sure we're using the O to and actually turn on an, an output. All right, last one we're going to add here for this uh, this demonstration is an analog input card. So I'm going to go new module, and I'm going to go 1756-IF16. Okay, so that's our 16-channel analog input. I'm going to choose IF16. I'm going to say create, and I'm going to go ahead and call it uh, analog input. And I'm going to just hit OK for the moment, just to get it created. And again, to show you that the uh, local now, local colon 3. So again, that's slot 3. And uh, here is our input. So this is an analog input card. So here are all the tags that got created for this analog input card. So a lot of tags. Again, it's 16 channels. So we have all these um, channels, uh, 7. You know, we got the, um, so here's all of our data. So uh, channel zero data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven channel data. So this would be our actual value that we're reading from the, from the uh, four to 20 milliamps signal coming in. Now, if I go back to any one of these guys, I can right click on it and say properties, choose properties. When I choose properties, I can get back into here and configure. So again, for the discrete input and output, Typically, we don't have to worry about too many properties beyond the default. On the analog, we do. We do need to do this. Now, first thing you're probably asking yourself is, why is it that um, it's a 16-channel card, but yet you're only showing eight channels right now? And the reason for that is because it's in differential data mode. Um, there's two types of analog input. Uh, wiring typically there's single ended and differential differential actually consumes two channels 
on the card. So if it's a 16 channel card, the differential will only allow for eight inputs. If I were to change that to be single ended, it will now reconfigure and we shall now, we will now have our 16 channels available to us. Okay, so that's an important concept to understand, uh, especially here, because this card is configurable either way. It can be wired, it could be wired as differential, or it can be configured as single ended. So also note that every channel can be individually selected to what its input range is. So they default to minus 10 volt to 10 volt DC. So we might want to make this zero to 20 mil milliamps, right? Uh, now, if we were actually using the, uh, the, the, the demo trainer in the lab, we would actually want to set it to zero to 10 volt DC because just like the Siemens uh, lab station with the little pot, the potentiometer that, that changes it from zero to 10 volt DC, the control logic station is the exact same way. There'll be a pot on the front and it'll be a voltage signal coming in. So it'll be a zero to 10 volt signal. But in the real world, we like to use the zero or four to 20 milliamp signal a lot. So we would probably configure most of our real world transmitters to be the current, uh, therefore zero milliamp to 20 milliamp uh, configuration. Um, some other things to note here is um, if we had any kind of major faults on this card, we would get a fault module fault code right here. So if you ever see like a yellow triangle or kind of next to this, a uh, card, you usually get a little yellow triangle here. Um, you, can, you can go right click properties, come to connection, and your fault will be listed right here. And we can kind of look up that fault code to help us uh, determine what the problem is. Um, and uh, so that's uh, that's it for the moment. Um, so the, some other things here is we can um, uh, usually here in, in the in the control logics world, we can actually scale the value um, right here in the software itself. So you went through exercises in the um, in the Siemens S7-1200 where you had to create ladder logic to scale, right? You had to create a, a um, the uh, scale X and or the norm X and the scale X block to, to take, basically take the raw analog value and scale it to an engineering unit. Here in the control logics, we're going to actually scale that um, right here on the card itself. All right. Um, so now that we've got this built, this is kind of our, you know, our configuration um, setup. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. We just right click, we say add modules. So if we were in actually at our, at our lab station right now, you'd be going kind of right down the line, um, looking at what cards in each chassis and then basically adding it to the to the rack here and then uh, creating a configuration file for it. And then, of course, we would try to connect to it and then we would download to it just like you did um, with the Siemens stuff. All right, so we're going to pause the video here. Um, I'm going to show you coming up in the next uh, kind of lesson, there will be a way for you to actually access the software in the cloud and you can kind of play around and kind of do what I just did um, right here on your own through that uh, cloud image.